Newt Minow has known 11 presidents. He was instrumental in changing the nature of television and communication itself. He might have the most impressive resume I've ever seen. Then again, if you listed the people he's worked with and known over his 93 years, that might be even more impressive. So you could think it would be hard to choose a starting point for telling his story. But in truth, the opening is a no-brainer. Minow himself knows that perfectly well. Well, I know what my obituary will say. It will start off saying, here's the man who called television a vast wasteland. My favorite part of the newspaper is the obituaries. Not so much the ones of the really famous people, the George H.W. Bushes, the Aretha Franklins, but the ones I haven't heard of, the ones who've danced along the edge of our consciousness. People like Wawa Watson, AKA Malvin Reagan, who perfected the sound of the Wawa pedal on the guitar. Or Dorcas Riley, who as a food scientist at Campbell Soup, invented the green bean casserole. As interesting as it is to read such a bit, it's also frustrating. Why didn't I know about these people while they were still alive? There's another reason for my fascination with the obituaries. To put it bluntly, I'm starting to imagine myself in them. Nothing imminent, mind you, but as I get older, I've started to think a lot about the shape of a life, my own and other people's. My name is Ben Yagoda, and this is Examined Lives, a podcast where I try to learn something from people who've done amazing things in their lives who deserve to have their stories told while they're still around. It was May 9th, 1961. Newt Minow was 35 years old, newly appointed by the newly inaugurated John F. Kennedy as the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. And we talked about putting him over in the FCC as a yeah. member. And he was about to give a speech to the National Association of Broadcasters. His audience were the 2,000 or so people who owned the country's three networks and all American TV stations. This is the Alvin Show, the Alvin Show. You're positively going to love the Alvin Back in those days, the networks, NBC, CBS, ABC, aired 73 and a half hours of primetime programming a week. The number seems laughably low now, when about 500 scripted series are produced each year, and when, at any given moment, you can choose from literally thousands of programs on broadcast cable stations and streaming services like Netflix and Hulu. Minow started his 1961 speech by warming up the crowd. He was a young regulator of this new business of TV, after all, and he wanted to win people over. But then he quickly pivoted. Your license lets you use the public's airwaves as trustees for 180 million Americans. The public is your beneficiary. If you want to stay on as trustees, you must deliver a decent return to the public, not only to your stockholders. The audience's discomfort is palpable. You can hear it in the nervous coughs, the clink of spoons against coffee cups, in the silence. Minow went on to throw down a challenge. I invite each of you to sit down in front of your own television set when your station goes on the air and stay there for a day without a book, without a magazine, without a newspaper, without a profit and loss sheet or a rating book to distract you. Keep your eyes glued to that set until the station signs off. I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Vast wasteland. That's the two-word phrase Newt Minow expects to lead his obituary. And even from the get-go, his harangue really sank in. You will see a procession of game shows, formula comedies about totally unbelievable families, blood and thunder, mayhem, violence, Sadism, murder, Western bad men, Western good men, private eyes, gangsters, more violence and cartoons. And endlessly commercials, many screaming, cajoling, and offending. And most of all, boredom. 
A horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to a horse, of course. That is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. A. The New York Times front page above the fold headline the next day was FCC head bids TV men reform vast wasteland. And by the way, the Times has used the phrase vast wasteland 168 times since then. Aside from a couple of references to Arctic tundra, they've all been in relation to TV. Vast wasteland is in Bartlett's familiar quotations and every other such reference work. It's been the gag line in scores of editorial cartoons. The phrase, and Minnow's speech more generally, has framed the way we discuss the quality of television even now. It also made TV people angry and annoyed. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started... One guy named Sherwood Schwartz was making a new comedy about some people stranded on an island in the Pacific. He put his annoyance to use. The creator of Gilligan's Island actually named the SS Minnow the Minnow because of Newton Minnow's vast wasteland speech. That's David Bianculi, the TV critic for NPR's Fresh Air, a professor at Rowan University and the author of several books about the history of television. And if there's ever a show that contributed to the vast wasteland, it was Gilligan's Island. Being Cooley says many people miss the point and takeaway from Minnow's speech. For one thing, the vast wasteland of TV in 1961, it wasn't so vast. The whole universe of TV uh, was like three networks um, and a couple of local channels. And so there wasn't that much choice. But what he was saying is that even with that limited choice, if you were a, a smart viewer, you could find good things. Just before he said, when, when television, television is good, good nothing. nothing, not the theater, not the magazines or newspapers, nothing is better. But when television is bad, nothing is worse. I agree with that completely as we speak in 2019. And, and it was harder for anybody to say that television was art or really good back then, but he mentioned in his speech Twilight Zone, Peter Pan, See It Now, Craft Television Theater, Playhouse 90. You know, he, he knew what the good stuff was, and he liked it. But he was saying that you guys who own your stations, you're not individually doing enough, and if you single-tasked, if you just stayed locked on what you did, you'd pretty much be ashamed at how awful so much of it was. And you think that was a fair and just characterization? I mean, albeit uh, a bit hyperbolic, but 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 on the mark. Oh, I think it's totally fair. Um, uh, was it Theodore Sturgeon who said that ninety percent of everything is? And then he used an expletive word. I don't know where we stand in terms of uh, what we can say in this conversation. I think we can say it. We're not subject to the FCC. This well, is a then, podcast. which is interesting because it's. We're talking Newton Minow, and so the fact that I can say, I can quote someone as saying that 90% of everything is shit uh, is sort of showing the progress that we have developed over the years. Tom Brokaw could easily have had Newt Minow in mind when he coined the term the greatest generation. Minow checks all the boxes, including being born in modest circumstances, in his case, to a Jewish family in Milwaukee. His father's name was originally Minovich, but the family changed it. As Newt's daughter Nell says, they didn't know enough English to realize they had taken on the name of a fish. My mother and father uh, were brought here as young children, as immigrants from um, the Ukraine, and uh, they never went to college. But my dad uh, managed to um, build a business and uh, we, were, we were never uh, destitute, but we had to watch our money closely. And then I uh, grew up during the Depression, and then the war, uh, the war started in 39, when I was only 13 years old. And within four years, I was in the military. The, uh, uh, it, was, it was an experience. Uh, I ended up as a sergeant 
in a Signal Corps battalion in the China Burma India Theater, where my unit, the 835th Signal Service Battalion, built the first telephone line connecting India and China. So it was a, a very important experience. It also, I think, deepened my interest in public service. To me, there's a sort of rosebud clue to Minnow's character, in particular, his empathy, his awareness of other people's circumstances. My brother, my brother Burton, a few years older than um, I am, was born with a, a severe disability. We never knew the name of it until a year or two before he died. It was called the Mobius syndrome, which is very rare, but which affects you uh, physically and not mentally, because Bert had a fine mind. And my mother and father were told when he was ready for kindergarten that he could not go to public school. But my mother said, oh, yes, he can, and she fought for it, and he ended up graduating from college. Again, like many in his generation, Minnow came out of the war a man in a hurry. I raced and rushed through college and law school. I had served in the military during World War II when I was only, uh, I enlisted when I was 17 years old. I got out of the service when I was 20, and I felt I wanted to make up for lost time, which was silly. So I raced through college and law school instead of getting a much deeper liberal arts uh, education. Minow did so well at Northwestern University Law School that after graduation, he got a clerkship for U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Fred Vinson. After that, he went to work for Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson, just as the governor's 1952 campaign for president was getting underway. Stevenson lost to Dwight Eisenhower, then ran again in 1956, and lost again. Minnow's daughter, Nell, says that during the first Stevenson campaign, her father proposed an interesting idea. Stevenson wanted to have something like the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but on TV. And my dad said, well, you know, the equal time rule makes that very difficult. We would have to get the FCC to waive the equal time rule. So they put in a request for that, and it took about eight years to happen. It didn't get waived until the 1960 campaign, but it really began as an idea for Stevenson and Eisenhower. The origin story of the vast wasteland phrase begins in the 1956 campaign. Newt Minow and Robert Kennedy, and Minow calls him Bob, were both working for Stevenson and traveled the campaign trail together. They both had young children, and on the campaign trail, they had a lot of conversations about the huge role television played in the kids' lives. That interest led Bob's brother, John F. Kennedy, after his election in 1960, to ask Minow to head the FCC. Just weeks after taking the post, he was invited to address the Broadcasters Association. He worked on a speech with another colleague from the Stevenson campaign, a journalist and author named John Bartlow Martin. Martin was a close friend of Minow's, and he offered to help him with the first draft of the speech. One of Martin's lines was, vast wasteland of junk. I crossed off of junk, and I didn't pay any attention to the line after that. That's Minow speaking on the PBS show In Common with Mike Leonard. Whatever he's asked about the vast wasteland speech, which is a lot of time spanning 58 years, Minow always mentions that John Bartlow Martin originated the phrase. And that is significant. Newt Minow is a truly modest and authentically decent man. And it's a surprising thing about Minow, considering the line he's famous for, he's about as far from a scold as it's possible to be. He's friendly, down to earth, and he's got an excellent sense of humor. A wall in the Chicago office, where he still works, is covered with vast wasteland cartoons, plus a life preserver prop from Gilligan's Island with S.S. Minnow printed on it. He often refers to what his three daughters, all of them lawyers like him, have threatened to engrave on his headstone. It's five words. 
on to a vaster wasteland. Minow only stayed at the FCC job for two years, then went back to practicing law. But his tenure at the agency had huge implications, and not only because of vast wasteland and all it entailed. As the FCC commissioner, just in those two years when he was there, from 61 to 63, he did a couple of things which really did change television significantly. That's TV critic and historian David Biancooley again. One was he sort of uh, forced in the law that said that all TV sets manufactured from then on had to be able to pick up UHF as well as VHF, which without getting technical just widened the options available. So he was sort of solving his own vast wasteland puzzle by saying, here's more things you can watch. Minow's other big contribution had to do with an advancement in the very nature of communication. In the war, he had strung telephone wire. Now, he recognized that not even the sky was the limit. At the time, the space race against the Soviet Union was raging. On his first day as FCC commissioner, Minow got a visit from an engineer named Tam Craven. Minow recently told PBS about their conversation. He said, you know what a communication satellite is? I said, no, sir, I don't. He groaned. He said, I was afraid of that. He said, I'm trying to get this place interested in communication satellites. It's the one place where we're ahead of the Russians. I can't get anybody to do anything about it. I said, well, if you'll teach me, and if it's what you say, I said, I will work on it. Well, he taught me, and I saw he was right. And we then developed the, the first communication satellite. The satellites would eventually permit the development of cell phones and GPS and a host of other technologies we now feel we can't live without. But even before that, they brought about a sea change in the way Americans watch TV and the choices they were offered. When I started as a TV critic, Oh, my God, 1975. Ted Turner had just taken advantage of Newton Minow and launched, uh, you know, the first nationwide satellite network out of Atlanta. And cable TV, as we know it, started from that. And it has just grown exponentially, doesn't even cover it. It's insane. When you say took advantage of Newton Minow, what did you mean by that? Uh, Well, because the communication satellite was up there, Ted Turner was the first person who figured out how to how to deal with it and what to make out of it. He threw up, you know, a bunch of old reruns of of Andy Griffith and the Honeymooners and shows like that, along with uh, rights to the Atlanta Braves baseball team and just showed it. But you could see that not just in Georgia, but anywhere in the country. And since you know, late at night, there was nothing else to watch. And even during the daytime and, and prime time, sometimes the networks weren't doing that well in the mid-70s. It happened. And then within a year, you had, I mean, you had HBO that same year go nationwide. And So eventually, um, Chicago Cubs, or excuse me, so eventually Atlanta Braves and Andy Griffith reruns begat uh, Sopranos and The Wire. Exactly. Exactly. Of course, uh, Sopranos and The Wire begat Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones and, and, and. A few years ago, John Landgraf, the head of the FX cable network, gave a speech to a group of TV critics in which he argued that we are in an age of peak television. That phrase, sometimes shortened to peak TV, has been quoted almost as often as vast wasteland. For Landgraf, Peak TV is a double-edged sword. I would argue that Mr. Minow was right, that we needed more than three channels and we needed more variety, and that variety actually did create um, more diversity and new niches in which new kinds of experimentation and risk and quality could happen, and it really led to the golden age of television, and that's a fundamentally good thing. But, you know, there's a dynamic tension between not enough and too much, and when you get to too much, you have another problem which is now you have no bottleneck that actually forces you to have that level of quality control, and you don't have a methodology for finding the best stuff, 
Um, and you have an enormous amount of redundancy, meaning shows that have the same characters or the same themes are very similar. Um, and, and ultimately, you feel sort of choked by uh, the fact that you just can't even keep track of it all. I work in television. I couldn't possibly name uh, half of those 500 television shows, and I do this for a living, and I'm compulsively organized and very interested hmm. in, in knowing everything I can. John Landgraf has never met Newt Minow, but he identifies with him in one particular way. Newt Minow has had an incredible life, and he's a fascinating, complex man and a complex thinker, and his whole existence is re reduced to two words. And it seems like no matter what I do, uh, conceivably everything I've ever done in television, my entire re existence will be reduced to peak TV. There's something about that idea, a two-word epigraph for an epic life, that's almost irresistible. But Newton Minow, a man in a hurry, has done so much more. He was instrumental in building Sidley Austin, the Chicago law firm where he's still a partner, still goes into the office several days a week. He's been chairman of the Rand Corporation. He's a life trustee of the Mayo Clinic in Notre Dame, where he was the first Jewish member of the board. He was the co-chair of the 1976 and 1980 presidential debates, he was chairman of a special advisory committee to the Secretary of Defense on protecting civil liberties in the fight against terrorism. For many years, he was the honorary consul general of Singapore, for Pete's sake. Probably his most consistent extracurricular involvement has been with public TV, starting in the days when it was called educational television. Minow served for a time as chairman of PBS. But before that, he was chairman of the Carnegie Corporation at a time when that foundation was heavily involved in the promotion of quality children's programming. In the post, he made things happen in a typical kind of uncanny, uber-connected, zelligy, Newt Minow way. In 1969, a Republican operative named Dean Birch accepted the position of FCC chair under Richard Nixon. Shortly after starting the job, Birch made a phone call to Minow, who was, of course, a friend. Minow had just heard a pitch from a woman named Joan Cooney who was trying to make a show for kids. His daughter, Nell, tells the story. It's great. It's going to have, like, sell uh, the alphabet and numbers to children the way they sell, you know, breakfast cereal and toys. And so Dean Birch said, Joan Cooney, uh, was her maiden name Gantz? And my dad said, oh, yeah, that's right, Joan Gans Cooney. Her name is Joan Gans Cooney. And uh, he said, I proposed to her when we were in college. Bring her in here to see me. Dean Birch and Joan Cooney both grew up in Arizona. Newt Minow reunites them and takes them to see the head of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Barry Goldwater of Arizona. So they went to see um, Barry Goldwater, and she introduced herself, and, she, and he said, Gans are you related to Harry Gantz? And she said, oh, it's my father. And he said, Harry Gantz gave me the first contribution for my first campaign. Whatever you want, you got it. And that was how they got a million dollars for Sesame Street. Newt Minow didn't create Sesame Street, but Sesame Street wouldn't have happened without him. He is the connector. That's his superpower. There's time for one more story. In 1989, Newt got a call from his daughter Martha, then a professor at Harvard Law School. She would later become its dean. Martha said she was so impressed with one of her first-year students that she thought her dad should hire him as a summer intern, even though Sidley Austin had a policy of not hiring first-years. I said, what's his name? And she says, Barack Obama. This is Newt Minow on the PBS show In Common with Mike Leonard. I said, you got to spell that out for me. <laughs> so she spelled it out. I said, OK, I'll try. So I called our hiring partner, uh, John Levy, and I said, Martha called. She said, she's got a first-year student who's exceptional. And I said, here's his name, Barack Obama. And uh, John started to laugh. I said, what are you laughing about? It's not funny. He said, we've hired him already. He said, we heard he's a superstar. We've hired him. He's coming. 
and he, he came and he was worked, his supervisor was a young woman, also a Harvard Law School graduate, named Michelle Robinson. Some weeks later, Michelle Robinson and Barack Obama went on their first date to a showing of the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. And who do you think they ran into in the popcorn line? Newt Minow and his wife, Joe. Three years later, Barack and Michelle were married. And when I see, have seen Barack, he always says the same thing, which is not exactly true. He says, um, thank you for introducing me to Michelle. And I said, I didn't introduce you to Michelle. He says, yeah, but he said, if I hadn't joined your law firm, I wouldn't have met her. As Obama became an Illinois state senator and then a U.S. senator, he considered Minow and Minow's best friend, a lawyer and judge named Abner Mikva, his political mentors. In 2006, Senator Obama set up a meeting with both men. And he sat down and said, um, I'm taking Michelle and the girls to Hawaii, and we're going to make a decision whether I run for president. And I am torn on one issue, and that is I want to be a good father, and I never had a father. And I know that you two have been good fathers, and you and your wives have raised uh, marvelous children who grew up to be wonderful women. You know something about being a father. What do you think? So Abner and I said, um, we're not psychiatrists, we're not experts on child development, but we think that a greatest influence that a father has on a child is not when they're very small, it's when they're really, when they're teenagers, when they're, that's when the father has, is the most important. So I see Barack writing all this down. I said, why are you writing this down? He said, I want to give this to Michelle. And we talked a while, and we said, if you're, if you're going to run for president, better, you're better off running when your kids are small, because it isn't that important, uh, your role then. And if you got elected, uh, you'd be living over the store, and you'd be with your kids all day long. And uh, he's still writing this down. Uh, the last month, Barack was in office. He was interviewed in a piece in the uh, style section of the New York Times about his family life. And in it, he said, I decided to run for president when my children were small because a father's greatest influence is not when they're very small, it's when they're teenagers. And besides, I now live over the store, and I'm with my children all the time. And I thought to myself, my God, it's 10 years later. This is 20, 10 years after that conversation. He remembers it word for word, what we talked about. I can't believe this. It was also in 2016 that President Barack Obama presented Newton Minow with the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. News organizations like the New York Times and the Associated Press customarily prepare advance obituaries of major figures who have gotten along in years. I have not seen the text of any of Newt Minow's obits, but I can absolutely guarantee that vast wasteland has pride of place in all of them. Fine. But if it were up to him, how would his obituary begin? Well, I, I would rather th that they say, here's a person who loved his family, who loved his country, and who devoted himself to uh, family and country and in a, a very effective way. That sounds about right. 